And how were you doing relative to the other people? Oh, well, we were going okay. I'm like, so do you think everybody had it feeling nice? Or do you think everybody had it feeling shit? And you just didn't like the fact it felt shit. So therefore you started playing with things and then you lost your lane. At times we have to sail the boat in a way that is not feeling nice or that is the, the amount of rudder angle that as Gareth said, gives you the extra bit of lift because it's a long keel boat boat that sails heeled over. But it's about us knowing and having calibrated and done things to test what our decent speed angles are and our decent um, straight line speed setup is such that we can know when it's good and know when it's not good. And, and actually the difference between those things can be really quite small. So what I'm, what I'm interested in is what can we do now between now and starting sailing in the uh, first or 30th of, uh, of March that helps us when we get back to sailing the boat on the water. So um, Richard and Jeff, what could we do to help you guys with your steering and your perception of what the steering is to try and help make sure that when you get back on the water, you dial quickly into what the steering deal is because you won't have done it now for nine months. Yeah, it's just going to be time in boat, I'm sure. Um, it's, it's, it's such a changeable feeling as well. There'll be two sails on my own and, and the sea state changes everything so much that it, 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 it's just time back in the boat. I, mean, I sailed this afternoon and it was terrible. You know, it was like a, you know, a three-legged man crossing the road. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I think it's time back in the boat. Yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. All right, so so by hopefully by the time we get to the end of this chat tonight, then it'll be pretty clear on what the priorities you got are. And, 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 and it's great to get that as a little bit of feedback. So steering is one thing. We've just had a good little discussion about that. Has anybody got any more questions, queries, or thoughts, or concepts that we need to just dis describe and oops, discuss around steering from, uh, from a perspective of trying to help learn how to get back into it when we get back on the water? Hugh, I can so, Yeah. I, <clears throat> I was just gonna say, like, I guess, this is perhaps more idiosyncratic to the laser, um than anything else but one thing i've noticed i've only really been sailing at uh limington probably 18 months really and let's face it half of that's been canned um but i mean the wind against tide chop particularly when the tide's running depending on what type you know time of the month or whatever um for me being fit enough to navigate and, and put the inertia into the boat and and hand in hand with the right steering to the waves makes a, you know being fit enough to do that and and hold the boat flat in a breeze make for me is like a 20 percent speed difference because i'm short and little and um for me you know i i guess i'm reasonably confident in my in my knowledge i've been taking a laser for a long time so i don't get it as there's no hope right but the biggest <laughs> variable for me is um is fitness and having the grit to, to handle a bit of a bit of a bitch of a boat when it's when it's windy right you know it's, it's so uh, and the, I think just something that I guess we haven't picked up on at the minute is the sea state and we do get some right old washing machines in Lymington don't we so yeah. um, that's the biggest one for me I think so you've just brought up really interesting things so so for the boat for, for those who sail boats that have to be paddled around the race course so like the laser and some of the others um or, or, and also for everybody I suppose so is that when we talk about sailing in shock and sailing in stop start conditions, then how might we differ or how might we alter our steering to accommodate for that? Is there anything you do differently in the keel boats, guys? Yeah, funnily enough, I was going to mention, I don't really cleat my main sheet. Even in the folk boat, I get sort of moaned at because I don't cleat it. I, I get a lot of feel through the main sheet. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, perfect. Um, and so in the skiffs, what how do you deal with shock? You know, obviously if you're if you're having to go off out into a bit more flow because you're not able to sail in the light in sail in shore quite so much, you might be into a bit more wind against tide than some of the guys who are right in shore in the flatter stuff. How do you guys deal with that? 
Um, it, it, well, downwind. It's um, again, like Roy said, don't I don't keep the main. I have it in hand with the kite sheet because um, I'll need to steer around the waves. Because if I continue to bounce over them, I'll just increase my angle of attack until I trip over the nose. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> whereas if it's flatter, I'll just send it and steer around with a bit of with a bit of rudder. Yeah. And, and not worry about the main so much and just keep pulling it down in the gusts. Um, but if you do that when it's choppy, you'll just trip over. So, so some of the, what I'm hearing there from you, Richard, is really interesting. So it was very, your description was very clear of some different modes you're going to be sailing. So one of the things I suggest you do between now and going back on the water, you just start visualising what those different modes are that you can remember. And if you get a chance to go on YouTube and look at people doing the skill that you've, you're trying to remember, then that's a really, really brilliant way of trying to help get your brain back into the practice of it. So we've talked in, in the past about, you know, how good Steve Backley was not throwing a javelin for 12 months other than three times and got a bronze medal. You know, so mental rehearsal, hugely, hugely valuable for everybody between now and the start of the season of getting back in, even if it's, not about steering, if it's about the boat handling drills and all that side of things. You're just prepping yourself up for and the kite hoist is this and the kite drop is that and the tack is this and where do I put my hand, whatever. And a huge, huge power from our mental capacity to actually rehearse stuff, really, really important. Um, so, um, so yeah, that great. Thanks very much for that little reminder and, um, and great, to, great to get that inspiration. So uh, hopefully that helps a bit of, bit of benefit. So, so trip steering is one thing, but trim is definitely another. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm a big lover of telltales and, uh, you'll have seen plenty of pictures of high, uh, fluorescent telltales in America's cup sales, um, recently. So on the left is a picture of, of what, <clears throat> what attach flow looks like and why you'd end up with telltales looking like this. Yeah. So the, the breeze is the, the high pressure, side on the lower side um, and the low pressure side on this side and you've got telltale streaming nicely when we go for maximum lift then we end up with separation on the lower side and and as it says here you know we're either too sheeted on or we need to head up yeah so our telltale behavior, when we're starting to sail and we're starting to get back into the boat, we need to just have a quick reminder about how that is and what that means to us for how we A, set sails up, but then also B, how we sail modes into chop and into different conditions. And obviously the last one is, you know, we're sailing high and pinchy inside the front of jib. So the wind telltale is very much luffed and the lower telltale is streaming horizontally. So what what why did i put the telltales thing up well because you know because the importance of of how you sail and how you steer has a massive influence on what you do in terms of how you steer to telltales and actually as you get back into the boat in the next three weeks or so remembering that actually you sail up wind and usually you sail with this wind with telltale just breaking a little bit when you sail up wind or actually in the in the skiff, you might sail upwind with them totally flying horizontally, you know, and how you set your sails up in order to make sure you get the sail set right is super crucial. Um, and the next little bit on the slide is you know, just a very, my apologies, it's not quite so easy to see, but, um, you know, just as a quick little reminder for us, you know, lead aft means tail tails generally a little bit more parallel to the bottom of the sail and much more twist at the top yeah lead forward vice versa and lead okay generally the tail tails all flying kind of between zero and about 30 40 degrees up yeah we do expect to have a little bit of this when we're tail tail flattering a little bit up just because obviously we're after getting a pressure difference between one side other that's why sales work but helping know and making sure we understand how and what we do with our tail tails is pretty pretty crucial and pretty important um, happy, sad, indifferent, any, any comments, any queries? No, fine. Okay, good. Uh, so another, another quick little bit of video, um, because I thought this then just nicely built on.
revolutionary new concept, and America's carbon mono hull on steroids. A new evolution is the twin skin mainsail. The double sail skins combined with the spar to form a wing, generating the power the AC-75 needs to foil. Instead of just a single mainsail that a conventional yacht has, we've got a twin or double skinned mainsail which gives a really efficient aerodynamic section. If you took a cut through that, it would look like a, a D section at the front with the two skins coming off, much the same as an aircraft wing. So, so, we've talked about steering, we've talked a bit about trim, you guys know about, you know, Senior America's Cup stuff with their double spin main cells. And, and obviously what they've done is they've taken what wing rings dig and made it efficient, but in a way that we can have as soft sails. You know, so what we're trying to do with our sails is trying to make sure that we can have that crash differential from one side to the other and make sure that we have an opportunity to try and help accelerate the flow of the air across the backside of the sail as much as we can. So in, 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 in following on from that, that then helps us when we think about steering, trimming into this whole space about balance. And um, when we think about balance and balance in our boat, then um, you've probably all absorbed some of this when you were uh, sailing and getting into sailing or whatever. But you know, effectively, our sailboat has uh, a number of forces relating to it. And when we're sailing, what we're trying to do is most effectively balance the forces in a way that allows us to then help the boat progress in the direction of motion as fast as possible. Um, you know, we've got the resistance, we've got the, the, the force from the keel and all the appendages in the water, um, which is offsetting the force from the sail. We've also got a lot of uh, drag as it shows there on the left and the net direction is the direction we have going forward. So the most, more efficient we can be with our balancing forces um, then the, um, to create this uh, force in a direction of motion, the better. So how do we go about doing that? Well, you know, we've got a number of controls. So I'll start off by uh, picking up on something that people have said before, but um, this is the point at which I'm going to provide some little pro prompts for you. And then, um, and then we're going to go into a, a little breakout room, hopefully, or if everybody thinks it's been going quite well, we're just chatting amongst ourselves now, we can stick it as is. Um, but I just want to create a little bit of thought and, and, and more comment for us around what is important for us to get feedback from, from your ship. So there's the start for 10. Uh, Rory said sheet, never, never cleans his main sheet. Um, what else can we get feedback from that's going to help us know that we're getting, we're working to the bone, it's, best boat balance form to be the fastest we can on the water. Any other suggestions? And the list rudder. is very dark, sorry. Rudder? Yeah, rudder. Which one was that? Go on. How flat it is. So I thought that we can get quite a lot from the feedback of how our boat's accelerating through the waves and different conditions. From the heel, how the boat's balanced and how the boat's responding to heel through different gusts and different um, wind changes and, and any difference in the, in the chop and the wave state. Pitch. Um, pitch, well done, Gareth, excellent, good work. And, and, I'll, and I think, there we go. All right, so, so in each of your different classes, you've got different parameters that work for how it is and how it how it optimizes for you, and um, and what I'd be keen to help des describe and understand a little bit more from you guys now is what combination of those things works for you in what context and why. So um, I've got some resident experts. Oh, and the calibration one I thought is equally important because obviously um, when we think about what Nick was saying earlier about um, and Rory saying about steering through porridge. It's pretty hard to get feedback if you always feel like you're steering through porridge, certainly from the rudder. So when it is we do get a good setting that we do some boat speed tune up with somebody or in a race, 
The one thing we definitely need to know, and we need to be able to do, is make sure we can calibrate our stuff so we can, for sure, come back to that setup. Yeah. So really, really crucial that we can make sure we capture good, fast setups. So here's your chance. We've got some resident experts. Um, I, uh, I also would introduce Richard and Jeff into the skiff sailing mix, but um, boat balance, class specifics. So we've already had a little bit of discussion about some of those things. So Rory, Nick, what are some of the parameters from a boat, getting a boat balance perspective that you look for, you're trying to attend to when you are trying to get the boat set up well? So from when I sailed the folk boat, we had a load of uh, stuff from north and also from the glass on how to set the boat up. So we spent a good half day setting the boat up. I then moaned at uh, Pete, the boat owner, that the bottom of the boat wasn't very, very nice. So we worked about the bottom of the boat. I think he's going to do a bit more on that this year. Um, bottom of our X boat is getting done this week. That's really, really important. There's all it's a huge part of the boat that nobody really thinks about, but just expects to be perfect and go sailing with. Um, and then, so once you're vaguely happy with the rig, it's really hard on an expert to do that. That takes a couple of years. Um, it's then a question of, as you say, calibrating everything, marking everything. On our boat, we sew through all our, our sheets. <laughs> and I learned that from Ado Jardy. Well, I noticed Ado Jardine had got four marks on his main sheet as to where he pulled it into. And I thought, Christ, this guy's been sailing for about 100 years and he, yeah, right. he marked something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good. And, 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 you know, and obviously when you're trying, you know, so say you go out and you set up, set, you, you, you go out and it's a, a building sea breeze day where you might sail in a race early in the day and then maybe you've got an open meeting so you've got some race at the end of the day so how much uh how much you know boat balance tweaking with the rig are you doing to try and cater for that as it gets windier and what would you what would you attend to it's an area on expos and folk boats where everybody is incredibly lazy so we just don't we leave the rig alone we tend just to move it further aft in the expo in the folk boat i think everybody just changes their sail trim from what i can tell i think yeah. that's probably right rory <laughs> so if I just um that's a great point and I'm really glad you mentioned that. So Richard and Jeff, what would you do if you went out and you had a building sea breeze? How would you what would you iterate through on your on your setup as you went through a, an increasing wind couple of races? Went from like if you went out in 10 knots and you ended up sailing at 18 knots in the second race of the day. Um so if the problem is with the seven, it's it, it's a pinned it's a pinned rig, so there's not a great deal you can do to to move things around when you're out there. Whereas with the fourteen, of course, we can just put things where we like as the day goes, much as Gareth can. So it'd be a real about attention to detail on that forecast about when you think the day's going to come in. You're going to sell more of it in ten, more of it in eighteen, uh, and sort of sort of nailing your colours to the. To the mast so you set your lowers set your rig rake but once you have done you kind of start with it for the day with that boat with the seven um so then you're into your basic controls kicker cutting them out hauls, yeah. main sheet um so with that sort of building breeze it's really about when the race is during the day and how much of it you think you're going to be in each race well cool. yeah so one of the things um and, and obviously you know for the likes of pete and and dave in the in the single handers then obviously you've got you know you've got one sail and one mast set up and all that sort of stuff. So what are you considering when you're thinking about how to keep the boat set up well for the different conditions you might have in a building forecast? So, so Hugh, I mean for, for me, um, I, I tend to I tend to pull on kind of Cunningham very quickly to let let the leaps go, and I, I still sail deliberately with Mark One laser sails because I think they depower quicker and I'm five foot eight. Um, so I've still, I've still got a couple of them in the garage. <laughs> brand new. But, um, <laughs> Going for a good price. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, I genuinely think that feel like they depower. But for me as well, I think I, because I'm um, not the biggest bloke in the world, I, I tend to 
start pulling on kicker pretty hard, pretty early. So when I dump the mainsail at the top of waves as I go over the top, I can dump main really quickly and the boom just doesn't go up in the air at all, you know, and it, it, it doesn't power up and, and I, I get knocked over. So um, it's, it becomes a little bit of damage limitation, but I've got, I don't know, I've, 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 I seem to stay on the pace. But yeah, I, I start pulling on kicker pretty hard before m most other people, I think. Cool, okay. Pete, any thoughts from an aero perspective? I know we've got some budding aero sailors. Any thoughts on yeah. how would you address that? I, I think um, having a light hold on the tiller and recognising the, the feedback you get from the tiller and it's the relationship between heel and the amount of tension on the sheet. So you're continuously playing the sheet to keep the boat balanced, adjusting the heel. Our masts are a long way forward on the aeros and when you do pull a boat fully upright, it does get a really balanced tiller. Um, any heel, and it can go the other way as well. So recognising that, and it can change on every wave. It can change when you pull a kicker tight or the, the balance goes backwards. Um, so you've got to try and get, help that work towards you rather than against you. Cool. Great. Well, thank, thanks, guys. And Carl and, Carl and Gareth for the double-handed dinghies. You obviously got pretty manipulatable rigs. So, um, you know, what's your deep power process? Do you have a standard process that you run for all wind ranges? Yeah, we certainly do. We're um, mass drake and board interaction. And then if we're just, we're not like the Merlin, it's not so easy to adjust the rake. We can do it, but it's a, you lose time while you go for it. Whereas the Merlin's got the rake out to the sides, so it's a piece of cake to do it. It'll be jib cars for us jib cars and sheet tension that will work yeah. around it. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. cranking on uh, rig tension as well as raking, raking and board up and uh, and, and jib cars outboard. You're not like, on a one string, Gareth? I'm on one string, yeah, yeah. slot. But rig, adding rig tension, you know, you, you wouldn't sail in 10 knots with the same rig tension as you'd sail in 15 knots. You, you know, you, you, you start cranking it on, so you pre-bend the rig. Yeah. So guys, that's great. Thank you very much for your feedback. You know, so so what what we're really, you know, what what I've just heard is, you know, in each class you kind of need to know how how to run your deep power cycle. And you know, how you run your deep power cycle is probably the same through nothing to seven or eight knots, and then you just iterate greater magnitude as you go up the scale. You know, Rory and the folk boat. You know, maybe it's you do more with the with the sails and the sail twist or whatever. But yeah. you know, equally, maybe there's something more that could be done to try and help. You know, and you obviously you're talking about rate, but you know, something more that could be you know, knowing how you iterate through the deep power cycle is really important. Yeah, one one other thought on the jib. So on the jib sheet, we're we're changing from it's about thirty five centimeters the distance between our marks to give you an idea. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of twist, a lot of twist. Well, yeah. one thing that um, one thing I do in the Phantom before I start raking the rig, if it's very choppy, I'll um, I'll sheet out a bit and sail a bit freer, so it gives me room to move up and down the waves to kind of pick a slot, and then that you get to a point where you're just getting so hammered by the waves and the the slamming and you know, the, the wind speed that then you sheet in and go for the full rake and kind of, and then try and sail it flatter and slower, but much higher. So I'm really glad you mentioned that, Henry, because obviously moding is one of the things that's super, super important that we need to attend to and need to know how to do in the different conditions you had. And we kind of had a little bit of an in insight into that from, uh, from Richard earlier around when he was sailing downwind. But for all of us, knowing knowing your high pinchy mode and knowing your kind of normal groove and knowing you how you do your bow down mode um is really is really important to know for for the next part of what i'm just about to go on to which is is the decision making side of being a tactical genius um because making the choice of what to do when and why is crucial um, and and that's a nice little description henry of, of of what's important so now what i'm advocating is that you know when you're sailing you need to be able to sail on autopilot obviously when we get back sailing in the next, next couple of weeks it's going to be hard for us to sail on autopilot because we haven't done it for ages yeah. but 
if we have our own, if we know what our steering, trimming, balance, feedback loop is, which things work in what instance and why, and, and we can just try and remind ourselves of that before we go back on the wall, or as Rich is doing, if he is able to go out sailing at a moment. When we, get a, when we get a chance to then go and do some racing, then we have a much better chance of going and repeating good practice. So um, just as a question for everybody, of each minute you're sailing, how much of each minute are you apportioning to each of the four things you're, that I've got on the screen there? Chuck it in the chat or talk or whatever, doesn't matter. So how long have you spent, and say it's a, say it's a 15 knot um, southwesterly wind with tide. So, so when, once you've, uh, once you've done the start and you, you know, you've, you've maybe gone up the beat a bit and things have started to spread out because you're in all in different speed of boats. So you eventually you find yourself, however bad you start or however good you find yourself in a bit of water on your own. Then the, the head out of the boat bit comes, becomes really limited because I don't need to worry about anything out. So it's only if I'm battling with somebody which is rare really to be battling with someone up every beat all the time. And then I'm really concentrating on hiking hard and keeping the sail, you know, working really, really well, getting high and speed so I can draw away from people, you know, make the, if I'm sailing against the arrows, I have to make an impact going upwind and get upwind quickly because going downwind, they can go a lot lower. Uh, they can do a lot more damage um, playing the waves. I can, I can really, I've, after years of training myself and convincing myself and a lot of input from Lawrence Crispin, I can really get off the wind now, but you still, I'll, I'll be caught by an arrow nine or an arrow seven really quickly downwind. So I have yeah. to make a massive impact upwind. So it's all about speed. And really, you know, if you look at, if I wear a, a heart rate monitor, you look at the upwind part and it's, it's pretty full on. Um, so there's less about where is the, I mean, obviously I'm checking, checking for a wind shift, but I'm only glancing at the compass every so often because, you know, the wind shifts aren't, often aren't coming through that quickly. Um, yeah, so more about steering, trim and and hiking the boat down than head out yeah. of the boat yeah so i mean for me when i'm it depends as you rightly say henry at different times in the race course you have different focuses and when it's hectic and lots of traffic or when you're sailing along normally you know i I'd, I'd be thinking that during the middle of the season just before you're about to go to your nationals or your key event of the year then you'd be able to sail the boat upwind you know focusing on the sailing of the boat half the time and have your head out of the boat half the time. And, and, and basically it doesn't really matter where you sit on that continuum, but as you get better and better and better, you need to be able to be spending more time with your head out of the boat or, or hiking super hard, like Henry says, so that you can help make better decisions and get well, it, better once quality I get to the, Once I get to the nationals, it changes because everybody's got a phantom and so everybody goes the same speed up wind yeah, and, well. and the same height. So, you know, um, I was just thinking as well as uh, there's a, a bit where you make your choice when you go downwind and quite often recently I've found people going into the shore a bit to get a bit of get out of the out of the tide uh, and I've I've gone straight downwind made my choice early and it's actually it's paid off but you make a big choice as you're coming up to the windward mark you choose you have to choose when you get there and maybe jive straight away and then make everything count. Um, and of course, you're watching the other boats all the time. And there's a point where you have to jive over to get to the mark. Uh, so there's a lot more, I think there's a lot more thought process going on downwind, although you can't actually really make any difference. Once you've committed to going straight to the mark or going out a bit and everyone else has gone in, then there's separation and you just got to get on with it. Win where you win, win where you're in. Don't worry about what's going on over there. Yeah. Yeah, I think as Rory said the other week, we were chatting about win where you're in. So this nicely leads us on to this bit, you know, so how to become a tactical genius. Um, we'll just, 
And, and, and how, how to do that? How do America's Cup guys do that? Well, they have a simulator. So they go and they go and spend some time in the simulator. They go and do lots of international regattas in different classes. Um, you know, there's no, no coincidence that Ineos was doing the F F50 racing. You know, but so they spend a huge amount of their budget on their America's Cup campaigns in being able to provide an environment where the skipper and a tactician and the main sheet trimmer and a pilot can get into doing some 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 work and practice what they're doing because you know a line times out of 10 then actually when we get to go saying as richard was saying earlier we don't actually do any thinking game because we're so busy either getting out of the water having fallen in or trying to pull pieces of rope or whatever that we end up not being able to use our gray matter so what do we do then so how do we become a tactical genius well i put a few little ideas and we won't go through this now because i'm aware of time but you know some of the some of the key bits for me is uh, us being able to make sure we know what we're doing. So, you know, um, what are the que what are the performance questions we want to ask? Well, what information do I need for my race plan? Which comes back to a lot of our um, data collection before the start of the race. And then, you know, what are my key check-in points? Well, we've discussed that in previous weeks about, you know, am I going to the right-hand side and how far does Richard and Jeff go in relative to the other slower boats and you know and at what point does Rory go back out back out for the top left gain shift in in on a long beat up into the western south into the southwest and um, and you know and so and therefore what rules of thumb do I employ um so I just wanted to have a, a, a bit of rest in your thinking um as a little bit of entertainment for us and and it's another little scenario but it's slightly different this time uh, so um answers on a postcard um it's it's friday um forecast for friday is uh wind at 045 and 15 knots um the right picture on the right is the tide um we're going to start the race at 11 o'clock which way are you going to go at the first beat uh, Dave, Pete, and the single handers. To the right. To the right. Okay. And and um, for I, if I class the Merlins and the Scorps kind of with the skips, which way are you guys going? Right of middle on the shifts. Right of middle on the shifts. And the skiff boys? Oh, muted, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought I didn't need to hear Oscar. Um, I'll probably go the same way as, as the as the scorts, but I'm going to look for pressure. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Incoming tide. Yeah. And the keel boats. So the folk boat and the expo or whatever. Which way? Or what would what would your plan be? Well, uh, before, so right, and then a bit of just be careful not to overstand at the end. Okay, and then so um, so when we then come back downwind, Nick, what would you be doing downwind in the fight uh, boat? Well, going out into the tide. So at the moment we're starting at eleven o'clock. Um, oh wait a minute, it's and it's um, it's a uh, it's yeah. So that might not be quite so clear. So it's low water at six, and it's high water at one o'clock. Yeah. So it's um, not close to that tide to talk the other night. <laughs> Sorry, well, <laughs> I didn't mean you. I meant I meant yeah. you. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's turning on the inside first, isn't it? So we probably want to go in. Copy, copy. So you know, so what am I? What am I getting at here? I'm basically getting at that it's it's kind of a complicated thing, and that we need to have done a bit of thinking, a bit of planning about how to get to. To solve the problem and it kind of just come for me it comes back to some of these race plan things so let's have a plan before the start let's make sure we have a way of knowing what we're expecting to do and then let's have ways of 
of going through this next bit about the set plays and, and what to do. So what I thought I'd just finish up with is, is trying to just go back through some reminders for us about how we become a tactical genius, which is, is obviously there's all sorts of different ways to do it, but one of the effective ways I've found is by making sure that everybody just has a plan and has a roadmap of when they expect to check in with their plan. So as we come off the start line, let's make sure that we've had a plan before the start and then we try and execute that plan and take all our risks to deliver that plan in this first third. And so we've just said, it's an incoming tide, the winds wind against tide. So actually for the majority of people, they're gonna go right hand side. So they're gonna come off the start line and they go this way. And then some are gonna take the shifts and others gonna basically come more out to the side. And then as we come out of that side, then we're gonna to wanna to check in and another point and another point. So as we go around our race course, what I'm advocating uh, again is to just make sure that you keep checking in to, jet, to verify your decisions, to verify your plan are really repetitive points, are really regular points, so that you can make sure that your, um, your brain starts to expect to be after information and collecting information. And um, this is in response to something that Nick asked me for early in the week. Um, as a simple, if there isn't tide in play now, um, our starting, at, at the bottom here, we could suggest that there's a couple of simple, um, simple opportunities. So you might want to start to the left side of the pack for a left side pressure gain or maybe a tide relief that side. You might want to start to the right of the pack for a right side shift long tack gain. And maybe in the effect boat, you don't never start on, but you might want to start on port as we suggested the other week to be able to get to the inshore, to go inside, to get out of the tide. Yeah. But if we can start getting our heads into some simple, this is what I normally do in these types of situations. When you yeah. get into your first race of the season, you're already preconditioning your head to going, I expect to do this, rather than trying to go back to first principles every time and come up with the, um, the practic practicalities. So I tried to just put something onto a little sim an animation thing here so you can kind of see. So what have we got? We've got Blue Boat doing the, the go right program on starting on port. We've got the Red Boat doing the, I'm gonna approach and tack in, but I want to have the left-hand side. And then the guys in the middle are in the chopping wood trying to hold a tight lane. Yeah, so I realized that, you know, these are, these are flying skiffs. But as you can see, you know, so from starting to plan um, back here and, and uh, you know, to uh, your plan comes into effect between, you know, a minute and a half or whatever in the start time, you start to go, okay, I'm going to approach the line on port and I'm going to tack in as the reg boat. You know, if you're uh, wanting to be the boat that wants to start and hold on the starboard side, then you pretty much know you're going to be trying to rack up from the right-hand side of the pack and you want to be able to be careful on the drift into the starboard ley line and make sure that people don't shut you out or whatever. Yeah, but when we come into our starting processes and our starting rules of thumb for getting back on the water in April, then do think about how you normally approach the line and what the options you're going to be attending to and considering to get the start that you want to have. You know, and I'd have, and I'd have in, I'd be suggesting that you know for the faster boats then approaching on port and tacking into a gap is not a bad one, um, but equally um, the guys who are um, starting and wanting to hold and be on the starboard side, then you probably want to be really accurate on your ley lines are coming in and trying to really nail that ley line. So it might need a different set of data and race plan to be able to deliver that. It does that. That's very, very simple, and it's not meant to be super, super complex, but, you know, just having some, this is how I expect to run the plan for this type of start, hopefully is, becomes apparent by that. Um, and, so, and so also then when we think about our diamond, our roadmap as we go up the course, some of the, some of the things that are important that we have discussed and, and flagged up in the previous weeks, I just wanted to kind of remind you guys of, because 
when we have a chart, when we are when we are being our best version of ourselves, we don't have to think about it a lot. And actually, when we come off the start line, usually then we want to basically sell the long tack or the gain to the to the gain side first. Um, the arrowhead is something I've mentioned before, but trying to lead the pack to the gain feature is really valuable and really important. Um, if we are in a situation where we are the yellow boat here and we come off the start line and we want to be able to sail lifted tack, then putting yourself in a position where you can sail parallel to everybody and inside them is really powerful because you then get to be the person that control when everybody taps. Um, and when you then, sorry, is everyone happy? Yeah. Uh, when, when we then come to um, lead back in from the, uh, in when we, so that's parallel and inside when we're going away from the start, when we're going away from the run line. And then when we're coming back towards the run line, ideally you'd want to be either leading the, leading the fleet back in from, from the side of being the person at the pointy bit of the arrowhead um, and and that's that's a really strong place to be. As I said to you before, you know, don't duck pack, don't duck packs. And as uh, as Richard and Jeff have mentioned to us in the past as well, you know, make sure you commit to your plan. Don't get halfway through and then think, oh, 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 oh well, I should have kind of gone and done that over there. Um, and Gareth's favourite, which is uh, the shift lay line, making sure you and and Rory's favourite, don't get to the starboard lay line too early. So these are all rules of thumb that over years of Olympic coaching, I've found have been pretty useful. And, and for those who haven't necessarily visualized it quite so much, then I'm hoping that this, this, this helps with um, understanding and giving a little bit of an explanation of why we, of, of the long tack. So um, all of those start at the same point, but the boats on the, the blue and the yellow boat basically are sailing lifted tack which effectively because they sail that lifted tack first and um, that puts them closer to the women mark than the guy who's the green boat who spears off into the right down angle on a header to start with and is sailing not necessarily away from the mark but these guys are definitely sailing closer to the women mark and their first long tack and keeps them with more options to take shifts at the top of the racetrack and um, when we think then latterly of my idea of this rule of thumb of the arrowhead, then as we come off the start line and we sail up the, up the track, trying to put yourself in a position where we're like the dark blue boat and or the, you know, I've been a bit over enthusiastic here with what the blue boat's done, the light blue boat, but trying to put yourself in a position where you are giving gas to the yellow boat or inside and parallel with everybody to sail away from the run line is super powerful such that when you come back to tack back to the middle of the course, then being in this position or ideally in this position are really strong places. The red boat here in the corner hasn't got many options. Unless it shifts and massively the red boat to follow in all these guys and these guys get a chance to then tack on the shifts in the last third quarter of the B and have control of their own destiny. So um, they're just some quick little recaps. And I thought I'd just leave you with um, a little tool that I try and use at the different check-in points as I go around the race course. So we've talked a lot this evening about our strengths and how we develop boat speed. And how we do that is around, you know, going and doing two boats tuning and setting a boat up and knowing all that good stuff. Um, we also spent a bit of time in the past. I know Carl, Carl and Gareth did a great session last week on the Met side of things and interpreting forecasts and us knowing and you guys really understanding that piece about when the wind is in the southwest and the tides this or this. Then our understanding of the environment is super crucial. But the rules of thumb, some of which I've just gone through just then, are really important so the brain doesn't have to keep processing from simple first principles all the time. You need to just have the ability to go, oh, I'm going to start and do this plan. That's long tack, starboard tack, or that's, that's 
keep in phase of the shifts, but I'm going to lead the arrowhead. So I'm always the person being able to attack on the shifts. Yeah. So the more we can get our brains into some simple things that I just go, oh, the conditions have changed, or this, I'm coming to always this boat, what am I doing? And you go leading out because I'm leading the arrowhead. Then I just is going to make it easier for you or you're approaching your women mark and you go on, it's a shift ley line. I always tack bow forwards and shift ley line. Then it just makes it simpler for you to kind of work through that stuff. But with the knowledge of how you sell the boat, with the environmental stuff and with all these rules of thumb, you still have to make a decision about what the right thing to side at the right time is. And this piece in the middle here, this context, the priorities is the way you do that. So as you work your way up, the first third and get to that first third, you check in, you say, is it still about, as an example, it's, we're sailing southwest, it's a tide incoming. Is it still about the game feature on the right, the less tide? Yes or no? And then if it is, then I'm still sailing to the game feature and positioning relative to the people around me relative to that. And then if we sail further up the course and then it, the tide switches off, then maybe the shift becomes more important. Or in the second lap, maybe the tide slackened off and then shift and position becomes more important. Yeah. Do people understand what I mean when I say position? So that's your tacking relative to other boats. It's your tacking relative to the fleet. Yeah. So when you sail around the race course, know your men know you how you sail your boat sail the boat super fast but then also make sure you know what decisions you might make at what time and when and then at that stuff is all just knowledge you can bank before you get on the water so that when you're on the water all you're really then doing is juggling between position and whichever relative priority that is important to you and be that it's still tied go right or it's not, it's slack, and it's now about shifts, or it's really strong pressure on the top right, and it's about pressure, yeah? But by having this little reminder in your head as you work your way up the course, this is quite a good way of just keeping you honest about, is it still the same? Yeah, fine, go play. And then all you're knowing about is, is what you do relative to the people around you, this attack and defend. But by making sure you keep asking the questions at the check-in points, you can keep yourself honest and not start to believe your own smoke and think that you know all the answers. Because believe me, the more we keep asking questions, the better it is of justifying to ourselves why is it we're doing either the right thing or the wrong thing. Um, and I suppose to finally, that's kind of your plan do review, you know? Know your knowledge, know your rules of thumb, know your met, know how hard fit you are, know how to hike, and then make sure you know how to apply the right priority at the right time as you get to the next point to check in as you go out the race course. It's been a bit of a whirlwind in that last 20 minutes of me sort of downloading a little bit, but um, hopefully that helps Nick with a few things that you were interested on from earlier in the week um, and it just kind of tries to pull together a lot of the things we have talked about over the last few weeks into some little tools and techniques and things you could apply when you get back on the water in a few weeks time i'll open the floor to questions um, does anybody want to see any slides again and has anybody got any questions silence <sighs> <laughs> a lot to digest yeah for sure like the talk um as uh, as as tony says is going to go up online so obviously you get a chance to um go back over it uh, in due course um but um yeah hopefully that's provided some stimulus and have you got uh, that list of things uh from the start line yeah oh this one uh, next, yeah, don't duck packs and stuff. Yeah. So these are quick crib reminders. Yeah. These are meant to go, 
as you come off star line, if you don't know anything else, try and sail the long tack. As you go up the, foot, up, the, up the course, if you're sailing in a big fleet and you start boats, sea boats come together, if in doubt, don't duck through the pack and lead that fleet back to the middle. Because if it's a shifty day, then at least you're then getting back to the middle and you can take shifts. And, and, and these two points here, the parallel and inside and power forward and ahead, are about when you're sailing relative to the pack of the boat, relative to a fleet. So if it's if you lift, you lift inside people. If it heads, you get a chance to sail until you want to tack if you're parallel and inside. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Um, and I think on this one, it's so easy to pick up on something that Jeff said and, and Richard alluded to earlier. You know, when the side you're in, for me, is about knowing what's right for your boat and how you sail relative to your setup is a little bit similar to Henry's, how I mode for the different waves and stuff. But make sure that you sail in the right in the way on the side you sail so that you win relative to the guys you're with because if you've decided one side, you're not going to get to the other side. Yeah. I was um, I was having a little think actually that that scenario that you gave uh, for Friday uh, where would you go, and afterwards I thought about it and actually going right could be really quite hard work. You've got fifteen knots of wind, you've got the tide under you pushing you up into it. It's going to be choppy out there, and actually sticking in the middle, going straight up the middle. It's probably going to be a, a lot faster because you're not dealing with the chop and the and you're not getting overpowered. Yeah, and you know you'll also be sailing in an off slightly offshore breeze, so it'll be pretty puffy. Yeah, yeah. So so there's no right and wrong answer because each fleet and each boat and each thing has you know and how you set your boat up. That's why sport sailing is so cool because there's all sorts of different ways it's going to cut. But having a plan. And having a, a way that you can check in with if your plan works is basically what I'm advocating is important. So you get to check in and check and make sure that against the other people that you're racing against, either in your fleet or the people you gauge against in the in the handicap stuff, is super, super important. So you, you know, so you get that plan to do review, you get that feedback loop completed, which we talked about um, a couple of slides ago. Just pick up on Henry's point there, you'd have to go in that scenario, you'd have to go a long way left to find the flat water. We were out yesterday in a northwesterly, and once you got down to that line of buoys, there was plenty on, and you had to yeah, be quite uh, a long way inshore before it went flat. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but just, you know, going further uh, tides, right, tides king, Henry. Carry, carrying on right, you're just going to, you, you know, you, if you say you've got two knots of tide under you, then, then you've got 17 knots. Of wind. Uh, the, the gradient's too different in the tide. You've got to read it. Tide's king. Rory? You say uh, that. Carl. Yeah, so, so from my point of view, just, just to reiterate, you've just got to be really careful towards the end of that beat that you're not overstanding. Because yeah. that, that in, in a boat like an expert or a folk boat, that's massively expensive. Yeah, in, in any boat. In, Richard, in, any boat. In, Mr., in Mr. Lilly's uh, foiling machine, it'll probably just burn it off a bit and it'll go a bit quicker, but but in a, in a slow boat, you just cannot afford to sail further than you have to. Right. Okay. Richard, you're about to say something. Yeah, just on that point about how far you go in for flat water. Um, coming back downwind again, wall, wall bank is one or thing or two. We'll often head in to flat water downwind, giving away tide in a faster boat just for survivorship in that sea state. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the last thing you want to do is go over the handlebars. Do you? So I suppose, you know, the point is, is about making sure that you know yourself and your boat and you kind of pre, you know, you, you know what your parameters are before you go into it. And then actually, as you're coming up to the top mark, you're already evaluating what's going to go on for the downwind. And, you know, multiple times people just follow because they haven't necessarily thought about the next steps or the thought about the next leg. 
you know, and, 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 you know, and you guys sail here a lot and, um, and you get to into sort of routines of doing stuff, but the better prepared you are going into a next leg, then the more likelihood is of you being switched on enough to see the subtle little changes. Yeah. Um, and, and Carl, maybe you, if you sailed in a, in a similar condition yesterday, you know, maybe you could just talk to that, you know, what, what worse, what, were there any subtle little changes that you thought if you were racing, you might been important to notice in in that type of condition yeah so it's more northwesterly rather than northeasterly so it's even more offshore so you've got the flat water inshore but also a hell of a lot of shift as you get inshore and it goes lighter as you get inshore to the windward mark so it's something pete's really big on is um changing gears quickly as you get up there so for us that was things like letting the flattener off or you know how we trim the jib on the cars and things things you could yeah. do quickly to make and cutting them things you could do really quickly to make a difference to account for the lighter lighter wind once you got in there yeah so but that's not actually a tactical thing that was more boat speed yeah but, but but that's really crucial in this whole how do we make a certain you know the boat speed thing is is part and parcel this whole decision making process you know so if we know the setup we know what we're going to go to for the next deep power or the next power up then we can quickly be into, you know, our heads already think, oh, yeah, oh, it's starting to feel a bit like this. And then before you even think about it, you're letting the down all off or you're letting the kicker off a bit or you're, you know, you're crouching forward, you're leaning in or whatever if you're powering up. You know, so you're just starting, you know, by by being nicely prepared and pre-thought on stuff, coming into my round to come into the next leg, you can already have got yourself into a situation where you can be, can be, um, you know, not having to think so much about the doing of it because you already kind of know what the next thing is, um, and, uh, and and get into getting into that next mode quickly. So, great. Well, thanks, thanks for that, guys. Um, any other questions, queries, theories, showering matches, um, or anything that anybody wants to have or uh, understand? Um, more than I could tell. Who's going to win the America's Cup tomorrow? Ooh. Is it going to be over tomorrow? Who it thinks? Can't be, can it? It's first I think seven. Only three knots of wind tomorrow. Yeah, we're five three though. You can do five, it. Three. Oh yeah. Could three knots. Three. Is it not going to happen tomorrow? Oh, is it light? <clears throat> oh, okay. Do I not need to get up then? No. Stay good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can find out. Before you all disappear, I think I've got. Um, yeah, the forecast I saw was two to three knots. No good. <laughs> uh, let me see if we can find uh, that we can find. Uh, Fascinating today how jib choice was such a massive thing, and it's a bit like we were talking about earlier, isn't it? About getting Richard's skiff set up properly before you leave the dock, and yeah. they had to make a decision uh, ten minutes before the start at the very, very, very latest as to what you're going to yeah. do, and that really matters, doesn't it? Mm. Crikey. <laughs> I'd really like to see a uh, 15 to 20 knot race wind, 15 to 20 knot wind race before it's over. That'd be fun. Yeah, it'd be lovely, but I Just don't know. Just to find out, <laughs> yes. So that's that's um, what we time scale on there now. So current, yeah, current wind is four knots, I think, but it might yeah, pick so up at four o'clock. Right now. 10 hours to start, haven't we? Here we go. Let me just try and pull that over there so I can look. So, uh, so that's that's now. Oh, GMT. Hang on, that's no good, is it? No. GMT plus thirteen. So that's local time. So fourteen twenty. So what are we four in the afternoon then? Yeah, it's four, isn't it? It goes quarter past four. So they could be lucky, and have a southwesterly. Oh, sea breeze conflict, isn't it? Or is it? Wow. <laughs> well, there's, there's not much gradient though, is there? Yeah, it's not. Very little gradient. Uh, like there's nothing overnight, is there? Tiny northwest, northwest gradient. So I mean, maybe you know that's not hard for it to then the heating just start pulling everything in, especially this big uh, gradient coming in down from the southwest. Mm. And then what we got on Wednesday. Well, they did say, I oh know, sorry, it was wrong. I was watching the skiffs in Sydney Harbour this last week because that was far more interesting than the America's Cup. <laughs> they had a water temperature of 23 degrees. 
No. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so not a lot of thermal action. I'm sure that's what he said on the commentary. Wow. Where, no. where are you watching that? On the YouTube? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, oh. it's great because there's no tech to it or anything. It's just three old blokes in a, in a catamaran chasing them around. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't go it's in there, mate. There's no been there. Not in a normal yeah. Wister. Oh. <laughs> it was mad though, wasn't it? I mean, they were, they were reefed on the small rig at the bottom and oh, paddling right. around at the top. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's crazy. Uh, it's good. Worth a watch, especially about the downwind tactic stuff. It's really interesting to watch boat on boat and normal rules do not apply. Well, Pete can tell us he's done it a few times. He's still here. Normal commentary didn't apply either. <laughs> <laughs> Political correctness gone out of the window. <laughs> yeah, equals zero, yeah. <laughs> it's not that Aussie commentator guy that's on uh, certain YouTube videos, is it? No, no, he's no. very funny. Oh, that's Ben yeah. Payton's mate. That's Ben's yeah. mate, isn't it? He always yeah. digs him out. Yeah. <laughs> hey, no, no. <laughs> now, now he's... It, he's <laughs> isn't he's that Nathan Altrich, mate? Isn't, it Altrich, isn't it Nathan Altrich's brother? Or is it the other well, guy? Bo, Bo Outreach. I think yeah, is the, the one um, that does that. Oh, here we go. It, it, Bo Outreach. I'm not sure he does that, but isn't um, it's Bang the Corners guy. Uh, uh, Jody yeah. Shields does a lot That's of the commentary, it. doesn't he? Uh, he's the one who's doing the Sir GP commentary, wasn't he? Yeah. That's a... Oh yeah, mate. Sir so GP yes. was good before we got COVID. Coming back, isn't it? Going back, yeah, and then to have the first event in Bermuda at April. Ah, but yeah. I'm not sure that's going to happen. <laughs> Gents, I'm going to have to run. Thank you very much, you brilliant. Yeah. Thanks very much, you. Are we up for next no week? Worries. Monday. Cool. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, thank you. Be on for the 22nd, you next week. Uh, yes, but I need some feedback. Please send feedback what you want to talk about next week. Will do. I want to talk about my levelo gauge. Yeah, the levelo well, gauge. It's in the, it's in the right. It's in the right position there, Henry. It's yeah, stuck exactly. on the back of the boat, 